Welcome to the show. Glad to have you with us today. It's Ivy Nation Sports Talk, the Friday Rapid Fire Show, along with my second favorite co-host, Vince D'Addario. I'm Sean Styers. And see, Vince, you see why you're number two? You see why you're sitting at number two in the rankings right now? I mean, I figured there was some <laughs> nepotism involved. Um, I, I also realize the internet issue probably doesn't help my case any. <laughs> But, you know, I'm your hype man. Like, how can you demote your Very hype true. man like that? Come on. Very true. You haven't, you probably haven't seen the uh, the movie Iron Claw yet Ooh, about the no. uh, the Von Erich wrestling family. You, know, you, you didn't go see that. Oh, I know exactly what movie you're referring to. Okay. Uh, but no, I did not see it. Because it was like, that's professional wrestling. Right. And it was right. a whole, yeah, right, right, right. But there is a scene in that movie. It's like early in the movie. You know, the Von Erich dad and all the sons, I think they're sitting around the dinner table and the dad, you know, names his favorite son <laughs> and they all kind of look at him and he goes, <laughs> he goes, the rankings are always subject to change. So, <laughs> I mean, there you you're go. not wrong. I, I saw a documentary on the McCaffrey family and she, Mrs. McCaffrey, uh -huh. uh, Ed's wife, Right. Would have a chart on like the refrigerator, and every day she would rank her sons. She would rank the kids every day. <laughs> and they were like, and they asked the boys about it, and they're like, Yeah, you know, we always tried, but like, and they would, I forget who was like always on the bottom or something like that, but oh. they were giving each other a hard time. Yeah, but, it's like, like, you're feeling good if you're if you're the kid yeah. at the bottom of those poles every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they basically they, they promoted competition in the McCaffrey household. I guess which, so. I Which guess I so. guess based on the success that all those kids have had, I mean, I guess it worked. I guess I don't know. Rankings are always subject to change. <laughs> <laughs> I need to start doing that with my own kids. Just That's rank right. them. Maybe I need to. Uh, maybe like like every Friday, I need to bring out what the new rankings are or something I like mean, that. You know, like they release football and basketball <laughs> polls every week. I'll just I'll just hold up what the rankings are on any given day. It's fair. Oh. I think it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. John, um, I guess John didn't see my tweet the other day. It was, of course, in good natured fun. I, yes, I obviously do appreciate the hype and, <laughs> and everything else. But that's right. I'm your hype man. And that's right. uh, I thought the tweet was actually really funny. Uh when I got the <laughs> notification, I I, I wasn't sure laughing. if some people got it. I, I figured you would, but I wasn't <laughs> I sure. I definitely did. I wasn't sure who would actually get it. <laughs> oh, it was good. It was really good. All right. Well, we've got a lot to get to today. A lot has happened just within the last few <laughs> hours. So you're not kidding. Is anything you sent me still on board? Because um, uh, things have changed so I much. Did, I did edit the list a little bit. I okay, have taken away fine. because we've added two things since the original All list right. went out earlier. Hey, today. is what it is. I know, right? So fill in the blank. It's blank that Notre Dame has signed defensive coordinator Al Golden to a four-year contract extension. About time. Uh, I, but I will also say like, I was expecting like a two year extension, you know, something along those lines, but the fact that he was willing to do a four year extension, I, I was pretty impressed by that. I, you know, I think, uh, Brian had the tweet about the fact that Notre Dame has two of the highest paid coordinators in college football. I mean, if you'd have told me that 10 years ago, I'd have said you were nuts, you know, but they're stepping up to the plate. They're doing what they have to do to get quality assistant coaches, yep. you know, quality leaders within this program and they're doing what they need to do. So, you know, what it's, it's obviously part Marcus Freeman. It's obviously part Jack Swarbrick. He's still around part Pete Pavacqua part, all of these, but everybody seems to be pushing in the same direction for the first time in a really long time at Notre Dame. And so I think this is, is friggin' awesome. Uh, I'm glad that he finally signed it because I was waiting for something, some sort of an extension. The four-year part was actually very surprising to me. Yeah, I was a little surprised by that as well. And it, I think at the very least, you know, one, what's happened, especially this year, like as the season, before the season was over, people were all, you know, as the defense was playing so well, people yeah. were already wringing their hands about, oh, are we going to be able to keep Al Golden? <laughs> After a year right. ago, you would have been, you know, a lot of them would have been completely fine to see him walk out the door, you know, to right. someplace else. But things no are patience. obviously a lot different. Whatsoever. Yes, that's exactly right. Right. You know, so so now after all these, you know, this job turnover, especially once the NFL went kind of 
through its cycle and you had a former Cincinnati Bengals assistant he had worked with gets the job at Tennessee and all this different stuff and well he's still here and so now you get this you get this contract four year the reported uh, four year nine million dollars is what it's reported at so okay. I mean you know pretty good pretty good money apparently you know it's on on par with about what Mike Dembrock is getting so you've got two well-paid assistant coaches and so one from a recruiting aspect it it, it obviously alleviates some of those questions what do you do when you want to shoot down some questions about well is the guy even going to be here in a year you give him a contract extension and it's not just a contract extension it's a pretty you know well-paid sure. contract extension which means that it's going to have a pretty nice buyout that comes along with it and as we found out before you know yeah. depending on who it is buyouts you know they're 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 going to matter so I think that that's from from Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame's perspective. You've you've got young, energetic head coach who is great on the recruiting trail. Yeah. You've got two really good uh, coordinators who you know veterans are, like veteran, yeah, veteran coordinators. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, good point. I and I get, you just kind of put that in my head when you said he's young, energetic, and you kind of have a nice balancing act with the with the coordinators. We right. have been doing this for a long time. I mean, they're veterans, right? And so you've got a really nice balance on, in your coaching leadership. Right. And, I mean, obviously you look at the success of his defense, and that's a big part of why sure. you do it. But, you know, like last week, Jordan Clark, new guy from Arizona State, he and, and R.J. Oban, new guy from Duke, like these guys transferring in, they were talking about out – like. In, in some of their comments about why they're here, it's like you've got a guy with NFL concepts and schemes and look how good the defense was last year. And they see themselves in that defense. And then you look at, OK, what does this do for me down the road? And again, whether it's a grad student or a guy coming in the door like Kennedy Erlock, you know, whoever it happens to be. Like this is this is, I think, going to go a long way. This is really oh, big yeah. for Notre Dame to be able to lock up. Al Golden like this. And, you know, will he stay for the full four years? Who knows? But it's a pretty ironclad contract that's going to keep him around for a while. And like you said, the buyout situation is now in place. And if he does leave before that's over, Notre Dame will be in a pretty good position, I would imagine, with a buyout. Yeah, and I mean, I found out it's a little bit different in the NFL. You know, like I think in college, you, you know, you basically have the buyout. You just pay the buyout like right when uh dan quinn went from dallas to washington al harris one of his assistants the you know one of the, the secondary coach basically quinn wanted to, to take al harris with him but jerry jones wouldn't give permission really? for washington to interview him so you know again it's a little bit different in the pro sure. i didn't realize you had to especially if you were a, like like just quote unquote just a position coach get permission huh. to interview someplace else you would think that you know you can make that move if you want to but again under contract al golden's under contract so i just think great. it's going to be really big for notre dame going forward it's great news because obviously they signed den brock to a good you know multi-year contract they've got al golden under a multi-year contract marcus freeman has three years i believe left on his contract at the moment and so you know if they do what they I mean, I hate to say it, what they're supposed to do this year, then you're probably going to see Marcus Freeman get <clears throat> a contract extension. Right. You know, probably probably not a 10-year contract extension. Made that mistake once. Uh, but <laughs> he'll probably get an extension of some sort. Again, lessons learned. Right. right. Lessons right. learned. <laughs> Absolutely. Make them earn it. Make yeah. them prove it. Right. That's right. Sloppy Joe asks, would you fellas say Golden's extension means he's comfortable as a defensive coordinator is and is done wanting to be a head coach? I don't think you ever completely get rid of that itch, so to speak. I mean, maybe he is very comfortable at Notre Dame and he sees the success he can have. Clearly, he can be financially stable as an assistant coach. I mean, $9 million over four years, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um and, you know, maybe he's at a point in his career where that where he's good with that. I, I I don't know Al Golden, so I can't really speak to that per se, but he's making the best out of being a defensive coordinator. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And at the at the very least, again, he is locked up for the near future. And if someone right. wants to get him, we don't know exactly what the buyout is and all that, but it's going to be 
you with you know four years nine million bucks it's going to be at least a pretty a pretty nice sum i think it, if you want to get him yeah. away it could be Notre seven Dame. figures yeah. it could yeah. be that's exactly right so i think at least for now and you know and the things that he was saying when he was coming back he you know like when he left the cincinnati Bengals. remember this is a guy who was a position coach for a Super Bowl team. The Cincinnati Bengals were just coming off a, su- a, a close Super Bowl loss when he yeah. decided to make this move and and come back. And he, and he talked about hearing Marcus Freeman speak and seeing Marcus Freeman be introduced as head coach and like yeah. being in kind of in lockstep with the kind of concepts and principles and philosophies that Marcus Freeman was talking about. So I, I think at the very least, he's very comfortable – yeah, being a, a college defensive coordinator right now, and specifically at a place like Notre Dame, I think that Al Golden can be very selective. And if he if he decides, because he's still relatively young, he's only fifty four sure. years old, you know, he can be very selective. If he continues to have the kind of defense yeah. that he had this year, there are going to be people who come and pursue him. But he doesn't have to take just any old job, you know. Right, and, and I do feel. Sean, like there is, you you get to a point in your career where if if the vast majority of the boxes are checked for you professionally, he's financially stable, right. he's got a leadership position, what else he's do in I a need? successful program, you know, yeah. all of these different things. And it's really kind of a plug and play situation on this defense. I mean, they're just reloading defensively. At least that's what it feels like, right? Do you really want to take that chance? Maybe it is a higher paying job or whatever. Do you want to take that chance starting your own program, trying to build something back up and all the effort and Mm -hmm. energy that it takes to do that with no guarantees that it's going to stay that way? Because you're you're most likely going to take over a job that's down. Yeah, right. That's that's That's, why most jobs become open because it's not doing that well. Very rare are you taking a job like Troy where the foundation is already there and you're just kind of keeping the ball rolling uh, like, like Jared Parker did. Right. And so, you know, maybe Al Golden's just happy where he is. And, and like I said, Notre Dame is very successful and they're built to have success moving forward. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. it, it is, it is very interesting. You know, it's salty Virginia peanuts is always he's always, he's got, you know, he's he says, always very salty. <laughs> he says, does this mean you're giving up on being a principal or superintendent? Yeah, because I'm not going to get my administrator's license anytime soon, and I do not want to be a principal at all. There are so many things I don't want to have to deal with from the uh, academic side of things. Let's just put it that way. Athletics is what is the direction I would like to go, and that does not require any more schooling. So there you go. I still don't know why you'd want to be a high school athletic director. No offense to high school athletic directors. <laughs> You have to be at everything. And to you me, do. that's like, then you've got to deal with that many more coaches and you've got to deal with that many more parents from the fallout of things that go on with the You're coaches wrong. and teams. It's like, why do you want that headache, Vince? The- why would you want any more than people just yelling at you in the chat and on Twitter? <laughs> why would you want that? Uh, that is where it is key to go to a place where there are multiple assistant athletic directors as well. That's true because you can pawn a Not lot a of whole that lot stuff of places off. like that in this area. Though you are very right? correct, I don't plan on leaving this particular high school anytime soon. And they have two assistant athletic directors. Like that's the goal I would want to have at some point. But those assistants have been there longer than the actual athletic director. So I'm gonna be a dean for a while there, Sean Styers, and I'm okay with that. There you go. We're good with that. We're good yep. with that. Yep. It's a good point by Joe. We, he said Golden was asked by reporters last season why he came back to college football. He said, I didn't come back to college football. I came to Notre Dame, which good Joe answer. says tells him he's glad. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a different he's got he's got a lot of resources. And yeah, yeah. when you see moves like this made made, the fact that that they went in, yeah, all in to get Mike Denbrock. Now they're you know they're they're going pretty much all in to make sure that they lock up a guy like Al Golden. I think it's it 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 shows you that the resources are there and they're willing to put the resources basically put their money right. where their mouth is. And he's on the inside, so he knows what the renovations to the Goog are going to look like, and he knows you know what the plans are moving forward. You know he knows where this program is headed, and the track record since Marcus Freeman has been there is a good one off the field right Mm -hmm. now you just now it just has to relay to on the field and they have to feel good about where things are going otherwise he wouldn't have signed that contract 
By the way, I've got some insight into oh. those Goog renovations. Shut I'm not ready. Mouth. I'm not ready to disclose them oh. right now, but You're little like birdies have been telling me, like we were talking about, where is it going to be? You know, like where would you do it? I, All this now, different stuff. I've got I have some, heard. I've got some good insight into that over the uh, tennis courts that are there. I've, I've heard that. If that's okay. accurate, I've. And I think that's fairly common knowledge at this point. I didn't. Other I than that, I don't know. What, I, don't know. I don't know what's common knowledge. I, I don't. Know, that's fair. Else. That is fair. I had heard that from somebody else as well in a public forum, so I feel okay. comfortable at least saying that part. But like I'm thinking about, well, if that's out there, I'll just say it's going to go beyond that. Oh, like, see the the question from what I understand is where is tennis going to go? Because yes, it would it would extend not just over where the outdoor tennis courts are, but actually into that building like really? where that building currently is now see yes. that actually surprises me a pretty good deal because it's a pretty nice little indoor facility that they've got for tennis and i would think that you know redoing that was not really on the top of their priority list you know what i mean like i'm i have to say i'm a little surprised uh by that particular from what, I, under revelation. From what I understand the if not all of the money a high percentage of the money has been raised and it's just a matter okay. of finalizing plans. And, and, and I think that, that the biggest thing is figuring out where, <clears throat> where tennis would go. Because if they, because I'm that was at, a question that I asked and yeah. that was the one, the one yeah. answer that I was unable to get. Because they would be out of a facility for quite some time because they haven't started building a new tennis facility. So like that part is intriguing as well. Not that I'm trying to throw a wrench into the plans, but as I'm looking at Google maps and I see, the current footprint of the Goog, right? And then you look at the footprint of the outdoor tennis courts, of which there are 14, by the way. Like, are there that many in that little spot? There's 14 tennis there are courts. There? 14 outdoor tennis courts, and I think there's six indoor tennis courts within that building. They're gonna like triple the footprint of the Goog if they're gonna take over the tennis courts and part of that building. Like they're gonna if not quadruple the footprint, like, wow, that's a lot of space. It is. Like when you look at like where the, all that stretches, you're absolutely right. There's yeah, a lot of I, space. You know. know, I can do the whole uh, share screen thing if we want to really go down that road, but uh, you know, that's up to you, my friend. You can, if you want to. Yeah. Here, to let's, let's, let's throw it up here. I mean, people listening on the pod aren't going to be able to see it, but <laughs> oh, there it is. Is it on there? Okay. I yeah. wasn't sure if it was there. Okay. So there we go. So, as you can see, right, I don't know if you probably can't see my mouse. Uh, let's see if I do this. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, so there's the Goog right now, right? And there, yep. there's the, um, this part is the weight room. Weight and room. This is all football. Long building is room. the Loftus. Right. Yeah. yeah, this is the Loftus Center, which is indoor. We're basically where lacrosse was playing, mm -hmm. right? And then if you connect the Goog with all of this, like that's a lot of space. A lot of space. I mean, yep. and then this is the indoor. Well, especially when you, yeah, when you go to the end over there, over all the way over to Twickenham, where that indoor yeah. tennis facility. If you're going is, all the way to the road, holy smokes! It's a you tennis have just space. Quadrupled your space. So, yes, interesting uh, situation there. I would say that if that's how much they're going to do, that's a that is a pretty massive. Um, undertaking i would say larry says any idea when the goog details will be announced i mean you know i had heard they're going to break ground in the spring but i'll believe it when i see it how about yeah. that again i mean the last i heard again figuring out like they can't do any of this until they figure out where right where tennis is going yeah. to end up yeah and tennis happens to be in season right now. So it's not like you can just displace <laughs> tennis in right. the middle of their season right. if they don't have someplace set up and ready to go. For They're going to have to do it so. in waves or whatever, you know, in, yeah. in sections or, exactly. or whatever. And Big exactly. Licks Burner wants to know if the Loftus is going to be renovated. I don't think it needs to be. I don't know, like, for what it's being used for now, which is basically every other sport to practice indoors. I don't know. They that still really need. Needs they still be. need the two facilities for all the yes. indoor stuff that's going on, like baseball 100%. and you know, like you said, lacrosse plays games there and you know, all that different stuff. They still need two indoor facilities. You can't get by yeah. with just one. Correct. So, but again, like when you look at where the Goog is, 
straight shot from the Goog over those outdoor tennis courts to where the current indoor tennis facility is. You don't even need to touch the Loftus right from there. You could There's connect space. You yeah. know, you could because right now the Goog is connected to the loft as you walk through this hallway right here and it connects into the Loftus. And then you could just have some more connection points, I suppose. You know, you just make it one giant building. Um, but I don't think they're going to ever do it. I don't think they're going to do anything to the Loftus. It's fine for what it's being used for right now. Right. Right. So, so well, you know, that's something hey. that we'll kind of keep an eye on. But yeah, we'll see. It's exciting. I mean, I love new. So, and I'm sure. You know, they they keep adding to their staff. I mean, the, the, the football program keeps adding to their staff, whether it be recruiting, mm -hmm. you know, or analysts or, you know, all of these different things. Where are they all going to go? They need they need this extra space. There's no doubt about it. They need it for sure. Right. All right. So another move made today, fill in the blank. Notre Dame promoting running backs coach Dylan McCullough to associate head coach is blank. An, uh, an yet another great move to keep a good a great staff together and you know i think if you would have you know done a straw poll as to who the assistant coaches were going to be that could potentially leave i i think dylan mccullough was right there at the top of the list or or if not one then two right because we know he has aspirations to be a head coach someplace and he has had a lot of success with his running backs and so to promote him obviously means title promotion, money promotion, and that will be big for him on a resume when he's looking for head coaching jobs. Oh, he was the associate head coach at the University of Notre Dame. Let's consider him for our head coaching job. So right, it's win-win for everybody. You keep Dylan McCullough in the fold for at least one more year, and you give him some uh, – Give him some more responsibilities. Resume. Yeah. More responsibilities. His resume gets a boost. It's win-win for both sides. Yep. That's exactly right. And he was one of the guys who there have been rumblings about. Would he stay? Would he go? Because he is a guy. Remember, he's a position coach. And he left in a Super Bowl winning NFL team to come back to college because he wants to be a college head coach. So that right. is still out there in front of him in terms of his career goals. And again, another – I mean, the whole staff is is pretty young, but it, it's, it's a pretty – relatively young guy yeah. who has that as an aspiration. So at least for now, you give him more title, you give him more responsibilities. He's done great. I mean, you look at, at what he's done in terms of recruiting. He's got top 100 yeah. running backs the last couple of years yeah. in, uh, you know, in, in Kedron um, Young and, and Jeremiah Love and, and, and just everything that he's done with that running backs room. It looks drastically different than what it looked like a couple of years ago before he got here oh you know? my gosh so, like oh well deserved <laughs> a guy you obviously want to keep around as as long as possible both as a recruiter and a developer and so it, it just makes perfect sense that you would give him this kind of title and uh give him a little uh bump up in pay as yep. well absolutely and he obviously has been instrumental in, in transforming that room almost overnight with talent i mean it's just Stack absolutely stacked with talent top to bottom, even with defections like Logan Diggs, you know, to LSU and things of that nature. Like that room is absolutely stacked with talent. And you got to give him credit. He's the he's the running backs coach, and he gets yep. these kids to have pretty massive buy-in um, you know, in that room because he treats them all like hey, he treats them all like starters, basically. And yeah. they all have a role, and so they all have buy-in, and that's not an easy thing to do as a coach. No, so, and I, I think impressive. really the, the hardest thing is making sure that while well, you're kind of trying to keep everybody happy to an extent, that it makes sense for the team because some of those jobs were sort of more on display early in the season, and then they right. pared some of that stuff down really as the season went along. It's it's kind of finding the balance, keeping mm -hmm. guys happy, but also making sure that, that jo those jobs really fit what the team needs, I think, as well. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Another huge win, honestly, for Marcus Freeman, because I, you know, I don't know what the interest was in Dylan McCullough this off season. I'm sure there was interest. If it wasn't as a head coach, then maybe as a coordinator or whatever, but it's a huge win to keep him in the stable as a running back, as a position coach. And so then you kind of reward him for sticking around with this promotion. I, yeah. I think it's win-win. I mean, I'd be shocked if, if NFL teams weren't looking at him and, and trying to get him. Sure. Like the question is, 
what kind of interest potentially maybe did he have as as an offensive coordinator? You know, like right. I, like that's that's something that it's it's hard to gauge when you look at a position coach just exactly how suitable they are. You know, how ready they are. I think right now, like right. when you're looking at a like a running backs, so a wide receivers coach, an offensive line, co- you know, whatever it happens to be, who don't have other duties on top of it. But now McCullough's got more duties. Yeah. No doubt. So, Michael, we do appreciate the super chat, but he's got a question for Sean Davis about Super Bowl and Super Bowl. How many Super Bowls and Super Bowl MVPs did Montana win without Jerry Rice? Your statement, Joe Montana, nothing without Jerry Rice was silly. Uh, I would disagree with that, even though, again, this is meant for Sean Davis. Jerry Rice is the greatest wide receiver of all time. (laughs) So, uh, I have no idea the context of of those, but again, Michael, appreciate your super chat, and um, we'll try to pass that along to to Sean Davis. Yeah, I look, Joe Montana was a great quarterback. Yes, he had Jerry Rice, no doubt about that. He also had a lot of other weapons as well, and some of those weapons he elevated, and then some of the weapons like Jerry Rice elevated him. And and but that show me, you know, show me any great quarterback that doesn't have great guys around Tom Brady had arguably the greatest tight end ever that he was able to throw the ball to in pretty key situations. Am I right? So, I mean, again, that doesn't take anything away from Tom Brady, but Gronk was pretty, pretty freaking good in crunch time. And in some of those playoff games, man. So, you know, yes, it's great to have a guy like Jerry Rice. There's no doubt about it, but that does not take away from the greatness of Joe Montana. No. TD4ND said all these coaching moves need to result in more wins. I mean, that's sure. why they're making these moves because they think it will result in more wins. But you're right. They do have to lead to something. You know, you can't just give Absolutely. blanket paychecks and raises and titles and all this different kind of stuff. But this is what they're saying. We're all in on winning. That's why they're doing this. They're not just doing this to do this because they're sure. scared guys are leaving. They're making these moves because they think that these are the, the pieces that are going to yes. help them get to that. Ultimately, that These were the pieces that built this foundation and then can take them yes. to the next level. And I would say, and I don't even know if I would put arguably in front of it, this is the best Notre Dame staff that they've had top to bottom in a really long time. I agree. Top to bottom. I mean, yep. there's, there's not a lot of weak links on this staff. And so they want to keep it intact. And Look, I and there it. was a weak link. That that Marcus Freeman recognized, and and he was out the door. <laughs> he didn't wait. He didn't keep right. him around for a couple of years, and and just think that things were magically right. going to get better. He decided that a change had to be made, and he made it. And that was kind of one of the questions that I think you had to have about a young head coach: how quick was he going to pull the trigger on that kind of Correct. stuff? And he didn't waste any time doing it because that was one of the biggest knocks on Brian Kelly: is he hung on yeah. to coaches too long. Right. That's I mean, we said it and it was true. And Marcus Freeman didn't wait around. He he saw the problem. You know, you could nitpick and say, well, he should have seen it, you know, by game five or six. You know, maybe he did. But a lot of times you're not making that decision in the middle of the season. He got rid of him at the end of the regular season, not even the end of the season, end of the regular season, and then turned around and got a coach in time to coach in the ball game. Like that's that's moving pretty quickly. And I like that. Michael's hung up on this Montana thing, but like, I'm not going to defend either one of them because I can't stand the 49ers, but Montana, (laughs) he said Montana won in 81 and 84 rice didn't enter the league until 85. No, it's a great point, Yeah, but they did win a couple more afterwards. And obviously rice won one with Steve young Young, as well. A heck of a game in that, that uh, particular super bowl as well. Yeah. I got a bunch of touchdowns. I think in that game, if I remember right. Yeah, he had four, was it the Broncos Super Bowl? I think it was the Broncos. So the track meet that they ran on the 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 Broncos the year before they played the Bengals the second time. But, yes. Okay, so this week Notre Dame finally announced the Army game in the Shamrock Series that's going to be played at Yankee Stadium in November. My question, does the fact that this year is the 100-year anniversary of Grantland Rice's Four Horsemen, the famous Four Horsemen, change your opinion of this game, the fact that they are doing it? I didn't mind the game to begin with, but 
I will say that the hundred year anniversary, the fact that that game, you know, that, that was, it was in Yankee stadium Mm -hmm. and the whole, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, honestly, it makes a lot of sense. And I believe that game was also against army. It was a, it was a comeback win. It was an upset win of Notre Dame over army exactly a hundred years ago. So four horsemen were born. And it's like, really kind of how I mean, a lot of the mystique of Notre Dame came to be, you know, between. Exactly. If you love the tradition of Notre Dame, okay, and a mm-hmm. lot of people are Notre Dame fans because of the tradition, you can't be mad about this then because they are dipping their toe into the tradition that is Notre Dame. And so you can be upset that there's a second service academy and all these different things, but you can't talk out both sides of your mouth. You either like tradition or you don't. And if you do, you can't be mad about this. I'm sorry. You I just be- want to see him wear leather helmets. Put leather helmets yes. on. And then, you know, like get maybe Riley Leonard and Jeremiah Love and, you know, like throw Mitchell Evans. You know, like get get four, four Notre Dame guys and have them ride out there on horses onto the field. You know, like really do it up if you're going to celebrate it. I just – I remember – this has been a while. It was around the time that that you and I started working together at um, the radio station. Really? We were having some voice work done for the intro for our Notre Dame right. football pregame show back on okay. the old radio station back in the day. And Harry Callis, the, uh, one of the voices of NFL films, he, he took over after John Facenda retired. Harry Callis, voice of NFL films former voice of the Philadelphia Phillies, he did some of the voice work for us. And we were connected with him on the patch line. And so we got to listen to him as he read our scripts. But we gave him him the four horsemen. And he's outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen. And you can literally like hear him (laughs) inhale on his... (laughs) It was awesome, though. It was awesome. So we got to hear Harry Callis do it. You know, we played that. You know, at the start of our opens on the on the pregame show, it was it was awesome stuff, and it absolutely did. Like I didn't realize until I saw this just a few days ago that this is the one hundredth, yeah. the one hundred year anniversary of right. all that. So it absolutely like to me, I was not that excited about oh, you, because you already play Navy, and how excited does does Notre Dame Army get you? But the fact that this is the one hundred year anniversary definitely. Yeah. at least makes it a bit more appetizing when you think about it. And I just kind of, I want to see kind of, you know, are they going to do some things up around it? I think. Yeah, they definitely need to. I'm very curious to see what the uniforms are going to look like. Like, are they going to try to go back like way back or, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't like the uniforms. I, I don't know if I'm alone on that. I did not like the uniforms they had the last time they were in Yankee stadium, but I, I would like to see some sort of a tribute to the four horsemen, but, uh, we do have a super chat from Patrick Duffy, and he's 100% correct. Uh, Four Horsemen game was in the polo grounds. Because I, 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 yeah, I looked it up as now well. Now, this says what I've got here says Yankee Stadium was built in 1923. Well, so, but, th- but the game took place at the polo grounds. Did it take place at the polo grounds? Okay. It did. But it's right, it was right across the river from Yankee Stadium. It's like on the other side of the Harlem River. Right. There's a lot of cool um, photos, like from, but, from when both of them were still there, where you see it's like, oh, this yeah. massive polo grounds on one side and Yankee right, right, Stadium right. So, on the other. He's absolutely right, but unfortunately, the polo grounds do not exist anymore. I was going to so... say I wasn't, I wasn't there. So, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the super chat, Patrick. You are right. I apologize. I just assumed it was in Yankee Stadium because there's so many uh, great games that occurred in Yankee Stadium back in the 20s and 30s. And so, but you are absolutely correct. I appreciate the uh, correction on that. Uh, but either way, I love the fact that they are celebrating the hundred year anniversary. I do, I do love that fact. So, I do as well. And we've got people talking about some uniform suggestions. Beefeater Indio Eight says, "What about all gray, like the Yankees away uniforms? Yankee block lettering? Why does that have to be like the Yankees? Green. Why?" Um, Stymie yeah. says, "No pinstripes." I would just like to see them wear green. Just put on a green jersey. You put on that green combo. Green there jerseys, white pants, yes. and go to Whoop. town. I don't think it has to have any there you go. No thematics with Yankee Stadium. Because like, the yeah, the, that, the exactly. thematics need to be with a hundred years ago. Like some you know, like more traditional like, looking, basically. I don't know, and I guess I would have to do research, you know, what the uniforms look like in 1924, but they were very basic. 
back in the day, right? I mean, they were right. literally like sweaters with a giant number on them. That's why so, I said wear leather helmets. Like, I don't know how you would <laughs> incorporate that into today's uniform. Like, if you try to do something like the Steelers, like the Bumblebee, like, it's going to look awful. And so you, you've got to kind of find that fine line to how you want to, you know, show tribute to the Four Horsemen and to that team and, you know, things like that. But, yeah, just leave the Yankees out of it, especially yes. now that Patrick has corrected us that they didn't even play that game at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, there's no reason to. No right? reason. Because, it, again, like any th any any thematics that they do need to be connected to yes. – a hundred years ago, not 100%. like Yankee Stadium or the New York Yankees, right? Correct. Now. That's what it needs to be, too. Hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. So ESPN and the College Football Playoff have agreed to a six-year, seven point eight billion dollar contract to televise the entire twelve-team playoff through the twenty thirty-one thirty-two season. Do you buy or sell ESPN having the entire playoff inventory on their air rather than splitting it up with other networks being good for college football overall? You know, that's a really good question because pretty much what 95% of the bowl games are all on an ESPN mm -hmm. slash ABC, you know, network, right? And nobody seems to have a problem with that. Although I do like the fact that the NFL playoffs are separated and yes. kind of spread around to the different networks. And so you get some different announcers and you get, you know, just some different flair because they're different networks, right? I do feel like they should have spread it around. And here's my reasoning why that first round set of games. I don't want them all on ESPN or ABC because there's going to be a certain sect of people that can't watch those games because they're not going to be on network television. Right. And I think your whole goal of college football is to have as many eyeballs on these games as possible. The NFL gets it and they get the biggest audiences. And so their right. games are on network TV. So all you got to do is have a pair of bunny ears and a rabbit Over the ears air. and you yeah. get it. And college football is still kind of putting up that wall for certain. Not most of us, have, a bill, have the ability to watch on ESPN. But that's not everybody. And so I do think that they should have spread it out so at least all of the playoff games could have been on network TV so that everybody could have watched. John says everyone has cable. Well, no, that's true, don't. except for those millions of cord cutters who have ditched cable. They don't like, all more have and cable. More people that's... actually don't have cable these days. You know? and, so... and not everybody has streaming either. Like, yeah. yeah, a lot of white collar, blue collar, but there's a lot, there's a whole other sect of people that aren't watching this show that do like watching football that don't have the means to be paying something every month. I mean, that's yeah. just a fact. So, so, no, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. I think it would be much better if they split it up. And I kind of like the way that the NFL does. I mean, and that's what Kevin Warren did with that Big Ten deal before he went back to the NFL was he set it up so that it is – yeah. You've got games on multiple networks. I guess the problem was ESPN was willing to go all in with the money, right. you know, that, right. that that they're paying, and the other networks weren't necessarily sure. as committed to paying that money. So that's that's why. I mean, I think it would have been much cooler though. Like that 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 first round where you have games on campus, you're going to have basically. You're, you know, like your number three and your number four ESPN crews calling games. Like, would you rather have that or would you rather have Gus Johnson on Fox and, you know, Noah Eagle maybe on NBC with Todd Blackledge right. and that kind of thing? So you've got multiple number one crews during those games. And then along with that, you also get, if you're, if you're the college football playoff, you get multiple networks, just like on, just like with the NFL, like, CBS might have a game, but they're going to say, hey, don't forget, coming up after this, over on ABC, you can find this, you know, Alabama against, you know, Tennessee State, you know, whoever right. is is they're playing in that first round of the playoff. Like, you're going to have cross-promotion of networks, and I think that that's good as well. But, I mean, again, what it comes down to is ESPN is the one that was willing to shell out the money. And, I mean, it's the strategy that ESPN has been laying out 
for years. Like people blame the McAfee show for you. Like when all those ESPN people got laid off, they're like, Oh, Oh, it's a Mac. You know, it's McAfee's fault that all these people are losing their jobs because they're shelling out all this money for McAfee. Well, they've got $7.8 billion that they're going to pay the college football playoff. Yeah, like McAfee right. was pennies, you know, like compared Seriously. to that, it's not his fault that that was going on, but you know, ESPN has shown over the last several years, they're, they're going to pay more money in rights fees. Their their whole strategy is get more live sports, and they're doing that. You know, like they invested in Monday Night Football. They got Buck and Aikman to take care of their Monday Night Football problem. They're throwing all this money yeah. into the college football playoff. They went out and they paid a lot of money to get SEC football. You know, and they're like in the running still to to keep NBA. I mean, that is their goal. They want a handful of high profile front facing people like McAfee, Stephen A. Smith, you know, again, like you got Buck and Aikman, they got Scott Van Pelt. That's, they're going to give those people the biggest money, Sure, but they're also going to invest a ton of money to get the live sports because that gives them tonnage across, yeah. you know, throughout the year, it gives them tonnage and, and things that they, you know, basically programming that they can put on TV. That's, that's been what they want to do. So I do think, you know, again, like to the, to the original question, I don't think it's as great for college football that it's all going to be sort of funneled to one place, but like for, for ESPN, it's going to be good. Oh, it's going to be great. Are you kidding it's gonna be me? Great they're they're going to get all kinds of ratings. You know what I mean? And, and I guess I don't know that this would have happened anyway, because it doesn't happen in the NFL, even though they're on different networks, they're always at different times. So you're not going to miss a game if you don't want to. But I guess it was the possibility if they're on different networks that they might show two games at the same time. I just don't think they would have done that. I, I think they would have spaced it out enough so that, you know, we wouldn't have missed anything. Yeah, but, I think they would do it just like yeah. the NFL does. Right. I don't think they would have doubled up. I think they would have gone. Right. Th they would have, again, they would have done very similar to what the NFL does, where you're going to have, like, say the first game starts at 330 the second game would start somewhere around seven or seven three right. or something like that right. to allow for overtime and and I mean you could do three else. games a day you do one at noon yeah. one at th just like they do throughout the entire season right I mean right. you could definitely do that and when you've got what the the first round uh, is how many games it's only four games right yeah. Yeah. So that's easy. You do two and two on one day, two on the other day. Exactly. You call it you know whatever. So uh, so yeah, it, it it won't be a big deal, but I still think they missed the boat. A little bit i do too i do like i think college football did but again not knowing exactly what these other networks right were willing to pay that for was sure. the question you know for sure I, I, but i do think it would have been better for everyone if it was spread out the way the nfl does it i think it would have been better promotion for everybody Okay, so the Notre Dame women lost to North Carolina State 59-43 last night. And I saw somebody in here kind of uh asking about it, yeah. Throwing, you know, something up there. What do you think, Vince, this means big picture for the Fighting Irish season? I don't know if you saw the long post on the boards last oh. night by uh, by one of our subscribers slash fans. Was it a was it a positive post or was it a negative post? Um, I would say it was not positive. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I would say, look, it it could have been worse, but it wasn't. It, yeah, okay. It was, it was like, here's these issues, sure. and you know, these, you know, like there was a little bit of sky is falling. Okay. So. Well, I think I think this particular game, in a nutshell, exposed where Notre Dame is vulnerable right they're they're vulnerable when they play really talented bigs they are they're they're vulnerable when that happens right and they did a good job of shutting down hannah hidalgo and and whether that was them shutting her down or her just having an off night i think she was three of 17 at one point like if she's off then this team is going to be off i mean she's the spark plug for this team and then you've got you know uh dewolf was the, a shell of herself from the last game where she had over 20 and then she couldn't hit a shot. I mean, it just it seems like they all had a bad game on the same night, which obviously is not good. But I think overall, it's just Notre Dame has a problem when they go up against talented bigs. And NC State had that in spades, it felt like. Every time they went to the lane, it was like, yeah, no, it's not going to happen. Well, they did have a strategy when it came to Hannah Hidalgo, and it was to use their big to cut her off. 
from the basket to keep her out of the yeah. basket. Now you know I don't like when I'm when I broadcast. I'm I'm not a beat up on the oh we're not getting the call right. like you know I'm not that yeah like that's not my thing. You and I have had that talk many times. Right, and you know there have been times where maybe you have to bite your lip a little bit, but sure. The issue I had with last night specific to that was looking at the replays when like like Hidalgo would go in there. She was getting and, beaten up. And yeah, and and run into her and it and she was getting called for player control fouls. She ended up fouling out. The problem the, the problem I had when they would show the replays is River Baldwin, the big that you're talking about who was, you know, in charge of standing there and keeping Hidalgo away from the basket, she wasn't just standing there waiting to absorb the contact from Hidalgo. She was literally moving at Hidalgo at least two, if not three times. She had, like, I think four fouls of her own. So, like, that changes the complexion of the game. If those calls go the way they should have gone early, she's, out. she's in foul trouble and not Hidalgo, and that changes the ability to get – to the basket again i'm right. not blaming the whole game on that nc state is a really good defensive team and you know i should also kind of preface this with like it really it doesn't do me a lot of good to talk about this you know because of the position that i'm in calling the game and it's like you know if i go one way with it well you're just being a homer and you know sure. whatever sure. if i go another way with it then i'm being too critical and you know like it, you know it can be whatever it happens to be but the same team that beat UConn I'll say this the same team that beat UConn I'm talking about Notre Dame of course mm -hmm. three weeks ago is the same team that lost to North Carolina State last night and North Carolina State also beat UConn by the way and UConn beat Louisville and Louisville beat Notre Dame you know so it's like there's this conglomeration of good sure. teams that are beating each other on top of the fact that this the ACC is probably deeper. It's definitely – it's deeper this year than they've probably ever been in women's college basketball. So, like, there are a yeah, lot of good agreed. teams. And North Carolina State is the highest ranked of any of those teams in the ACC. And Virginia Tech is the first-place team in the conference right now. And NC State is ranked ahead of them, even though they've lost head-to-head -to, -head to them. And they're also the best defensive team in the conference. You know, So that factors into it as well. And – you know, again, there's like the stuff on the boards talking about, well, Notre Dame might, you know, lose in the first or second round. I'm as nervous now, you know, about that. You know, look, right now the Irish are projected to be a five seed in the tournament. That means that they would, like, if you're a, a top four seed, you, host. you would get to host. Yeah. They're a five. Two years ago, they went down to Norman, Oklahoma as a five seed. They won a couple of games. They went to the Sweet 16. You know, their biggest struggle, you know, you're right about like the post players have caused them some issues, but their but their other struggle, like post defense, Notre Dame's post defense didn't lose that game last night. What lost the game is the fact that they couldn't score any points, but they yeah. couldn't score any points again because they're going against not just a an above average defensive team, they're going up against an elite defensive team who not only had posts, but they also had really athletic guards. Sure. And that's that's caused them problems this year as well when they've gone up against that kind of ath athleticism um I, I just i guess i you know again they didn't lose because of anything they did defensively it they lost because they didn't score but i still th you know they they only scored 52 points last year at home to duke as well and they still ended up going to the sweet 16 so it's just there are some things that have to be worked out with this team offensively. I think right. some of it, and I don't mean this as a criticism, some of it still has to do with as talented as the freshman point guard is, Hidalgo, like she's still a freshman point guard. And there's still, you know, like Citron is only, you know, like she and Citron have only played together for a handful of games. And she and Citron and Westbelt have only played together for a handful. You know, so I think that there's still some of that going on. Sure. And there is, you know, there is a little bit of, okay, you know, the, the the rotation is thinner because you've got some key injuries. And I really think it comes back to that because I've seen, you know, like, oh, you've got to throw the whole offense out the window. This offense 
sucks. Well, again, it's the same offense that got him to the Sweet 16 the last two years with predominantly the same players out there right. on the floor. I think that if you have Olivia Miles and you have Cass Prosper, who have both been injured, you know, Miles all of the season, Prosper for most of the season, if you have both of those two, I think the complexion of this season is just a lot different. And unfortunately, they don't have those two, and they're still sort of trying to work their way through some of that. Yeah, yeah, and they can't they can't all go cold on the same night. Like that was they just couldn't score. You know, for all the reasons that right. you just mentioned, which are all valid, they just could not score the basketball last night. And I, we, you know, obviously the game started at six, and so we started our show at six, and so I was just kind of flipping back and forth while we were doing the show. But I watched quarter and a half i guess uh towards the end obviously and it's just like everything they threw up man nothing was going in and then they would get a little bit of momentum with a three and then that momentum would just go away like almost instantaneously like they couldn't right. get anything going from a momentum standpoint you know what i mean they just couldn't get over that double digit hump of a of a deficit you know and so it was, it was rough yeah they just uh, again for it it does them no favors like that is the most off night that Hidalgo has sure. had. Oh, but yeah. at the same time, NC State, again, best defensive team in the conference. They had a very specific plan with, mm -hmm. with what they wanted to do with her. And it it obviously helps them out if, yeah. if you're going to let your post player take a run at a guard and then call that a charge when they make contact with each other, you know? Right. It's literally. And, you know, again, like – People talking about depth and tired legs. It, those could be factors, but these are still 18 to 22 year olds as well. And they get sure to, you know, they get three to four games or days in between games. And they've got, you know, a great, you know, sports science staff over there that we've talked about. You know, we've talked about it more pertaining to football, but they work with the other sports as well. And they had a thin rotation last year as well. Yeah. And they still got to the sweet 16. So there are issues that need to be figured out, but I just I don't think you can write it off because of a couple of games. Because you know, again, they beat UConn three weeks ago, so they're doing, you know, something went right. That's right. their potential. They've just got to figure out how to make that mesh more yeah. consistently. But I just keep coming back to this. This is literally the best defensive team in the ACC. They knew it was going to be an issue. Now you've got. You've got to figure out how you're going to solve that the next time you see it. Sure. Yeah. And it, you know, it depends on what pod they put, get put in and, and whether they're going to be able to host or not, whether they're going to have to, cause they got, they got absolutely screwed two years ago when they had to go on the road. And then, you know, this year they're on the bubble. Like if they don't finish strong here and have a decent outing in the ACC tournament, then they probably deserve to be going on the road just based on, you know, where they're ranked and all of that. And so, but they still have an opportunity to host but they're going to they're going to have to turn it up here down the stretch. Yeah, and I mean, they've actually got their net ranking is the best in the ACC. And again, you talk about the depth of the ACC, their net sure. ranking is the best of any team, but you know, the the, the NCAA put out that top 16 and last night it. and yeah, they were they were not in it. And I believe NC State they were either a one or a two seed. I can't believe I can't remember off the top. Right. I think they were a two seed, if I remember and right. And so. I want to say, and I don't remember their schedule off the top of my head, but two opponents that Notre Dame has coming in front of them, Louisville, I believe, being one of them, are both in that top sixteen. So yes, Notre Dame still has an opportunity to make some noise and get into that top sixteen because they're they're. And they, that's the other thing too is you know like the schedule is still like they still have to oh, play yeah. Virginia Tech and Louisville and going like, to Virginia Duke Tech, next Monday is not going to be a cakewalk either. Correct. So, so I mean, it's another good defensive team. They've either got a chance to make some noise or to fall back and truly be a team that needs to be on the road. Right. I mean, right. That that's where they're at. And again, you got the ACC tournament as well. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think so. So Iowa's Caitlin Clark became the NCAA women's all-time leading scorer last night when she broke the record in the first two minutes. She only needed eight points to get still, the record, but she did it in the first two minutes against Michigan and ended up with 49 points last night. Unbelievable. But it was a home game. They didn't stop the game to recognize Clark for that distinction. Fair or foul? That's fair. I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I'm not a big fan of stopping games, to be honest with you. Maybe, 
Maybe that oh, hold it, me hold to... it. I'm going to stop with this bullshit. Dave, Dave, David, I just said at the start of what I said, it does me no good to talk about it. I'm not making excuses. Okay. I saw what you saw as well, but there's only so much that I can say because of the position I'm in. So if you don't like what I'm saying, don't listen. Okay. I just said that. And I, I just said what you said. With the same seven players, they went to UConn and won. I just said the same thing. So pull it out of your ears and listen, okay? And if you don't like what I'm saying, you don't have to listen to me. Go ahead, Vince. I don't even remember what the question was anymore. I was so Caitlin entranced Clark. with fair what you fell, said. They didn't no, stop I'm kidding. The game. I'm kidding. It's totally fair because I don't like when you stop a game for stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. There, there are natural stops in a game media timeouts, you know, all these different things. There are natural stops in a basketball game where you can do this halftime, end of the game, whatever. I don't like stopping games. And so maybe that cements me in the balcony with the old men. That's fine. I don't like it. And so I'm fine with them not stopping. I think it's fair. Yeah. Apparently they did a ceremony after the game. I, 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 you know, I don't think that they should necessarily like stop down in the moment that it's happening, but I felt like, you know, maybe when they got to a media timeout, they could have done something during the game because it is being televised on sure. national TV and the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like you yeah, could do I get something that. during the game because of the TV and because of the attention that that had, you know, that that game had on it as well. So you know, again, like, like, do you have to stop the whole thing down right in the moment? I don't think so. I did want to add one thing, though. Like, I, I, I want to, I want to say this. I'm not, and I'm not taking anything away from Caitlin Clark because she is an awesome sure. basketball player. She deserves the accolades that she's getting. She is now the NCAA women's basketball all-time leading scorer, but. She is not the all-time women's leading scorer. That distinction is held by Lynette Woodard, who played at the University of Kansas Ooh. for Marion Washington back from 1977 to 1981. She is not considered the NCAA, and she's got about 100 points more right now. Maybe it's 80 points more than what Clark has. So, like, Clark was going to break the record in, you know, like one or two more weeks. Two more games, anyway. yeah. Right. But my point is, Lynette Woodard, I think, still needs to be given sort of the, like, she is not being given the distinction. So there was no NCAA she, for the women at that it point? It was or not what? the NCAA okay. yet. It was called the gotcha. Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. And oh, okay. so because she played in that, even though she was at Kansas, played in the Big Eight, played all these other big schools, she is not considered the NCAA's leader. And again, I'm not taking anything away from, from Caitlin Clark, but Lynette Woodard was like one of the original greats, a pioneer of women's basketball. She was the first uh, female to play for the Harlem Globetrotters. At 38 years old, she played in the WNBA when the WNBA oh, wow. was getting started. So, you know, like she is still, she's got like 3,600 in some points, I think it is right now i just wanted to say that i think it's ridiculous that the ncaa doesn't recognize those players when they were you know again they were playing for you know what are now you know all the schools that are in the in in the ncaa but it was called something different and literally the year after lynette woodard stopped playing is when, they, is when the ncaa wow. started sponsoring all those women's sports wow so Again, I think Caitlin like Clark it. is great, and Caitlin Clark would still have broken the record within a week or two because the fact that she <laughs> averages 40 points a game, you know? Yeah, seriously. But I think that it's a disgrace that the NCAA doesn't recognize the players from those eras because, again, yeah. they're pioneers. If they if they didn't walk, then Caitlin Clark couldn't be running right now, basically. So I like where your head's at. I just I wanted like to that. I just wanted to get that in there. I like that. See, I would have never known that. That was the case. So I have been educated. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> People are saying I'm scared of you. <laughs> I wasn't yelling at Vince. Hey, listen, <laughs> I've been yelled at by Sean. Okay. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen the monster, man. I'm not scared. <laughs>
It's fantastic. You should have played adult baseball with us 20 years ago. Oh, my God. Don't even bring that up. <laughs> and that has been almost 20 years, hasn't it? <laughs> Still Man. have the jersey in my closet. Should we? I should wear it one night or one day for the show. <laughs> Um, so, so bear down soldiers. I, I don't even know why I'm going here. He asked if this has been a disappointing <laughs> season for the women, you know, look, they're the defending ACC regular season champs and they're currently sitting in sixth place. You know, I think that they thought that they were going to be sure, obviously higher than that competing for that championship, but, but you also can't count on all the injuries that they've had on, you know, that's tough. Right. And that's Olivia Miles, especially. The complexion yeah. of this team yeah, that's is a lot one. different if Agreed. Olivia Miles. And when you start talking about defense, if they had cast Prosper, that's when they that's when they were their best last year as a defensive team. Yes. She's when so Prosper long. was playing. Because yeah. yeah, because of everything she can do yeah. with the length and athleticism she had. But again. Just making excuses if I say, you know, that that injured players would make a difference. But those are two, like especially Olivia, yeah. obviously. You're talking mm -hmm. about another elite player who is coming into the season. She, she's a National Player of the Year All-American candidate yeah. if she yeah. wasn't injured. Makes a yeah. big difference. Oh, abs 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, you can't I'll can't tell you what. estimate the prosper. I'm not looking past the end of this season because I still think Notre Dame can make some noise. I think they can make a Sweet 16 run, depending on the draw, right? I do too. And like, I'm not worried about them in the first yeah. or second round. Like, the second right. round is obviously Agreed. going to be more competitive than the first. I'm definitely sure. not worried about the first round. It just, it's all, everything is going to depend on the matchup, just Absolutely. again, based on what's given them some issues. Absolutely. Sure. But I will also say, as I say, I'm not looking past this season. Next season, if Olivia Miles and Hannah Hidalgo are in the same backcourt. It's going to be interesting to see how they share the basketball, you know, because I mean, they're both legit. Going to change the whole dynamic. Oh, yeah, yeah 100%. Sure. I, I, very interested to see what that relationship looks like. But that's, you know, and again, when I talk about them kind of figuring out how to gel. Hidalgo is a different kind of point guard than Olivia. Oh, is. absolutely. Yeah, right. And that's, that's what I'm talking about with the dynamic with the rest of the team, because Olivia was not a player who was like, she averaged around 14, 15 points a game. That's like 10 points less per game yeah. than Hidalgo averages. Hidalgo is a more ball dominant mm -hmm. kind of guard. She is, she is a scoring like it's what Caitlin Clark is. Like she's still going to get her assists, but obviously she's averaging 30, 40 points Per right. game. And, you know, literally, it's like Caitlin Clark and four other players for Iowa. Notre Dame, across the board, has a better collection of talent, but it's just a different dynamic with the kind of point guard that you sure. have. And I, again, I think that they're all, they're, they're still figuring that out on yeah. some nights, especially when they go up against a much better defensive team. And that's what they ran into right. last night. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's not an excuse for like you still do you still need to score more than 40 points at home? Yeah. But again, 100%. I go back. They only scored 52 against Duke at home last year and lost to them as well. So it's not like you can look at one game and say this is what they are right now. It still depends right. on the kind of matchup. That with, matchup that you've got. With everybody having eligibility left except DeWolf, it that gets you pretty excited for what could happen next year. I'll just say that. Again, right. not looking past this year. I still think they can make a run. But, yeah, you get pretty excited about the possibilities of next season. Yes. TD says, would last night have been different with Miles on the floor, too? I do believe it would. I think every game would be yeah. different if Miles was also yeah, yeah, yeah. on the floor. Like, how that dynamic was going to play out, well, that would be for them to figure out. But by this point, if my, you know, like if you, <clears throat> like if you went back and Miles was healthy all season and they were playing together, I think that they would have a lot of that figured out by now. Yeah, but right. absolutely because you, because you had different, you had different individuals who were injured at different times. Like Sonia Citron was out for two and a half months. Yeah. 
You know, that's 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 a lot of time not to yeah. be playing with a you know with with a with a freshman point guard. Hundred percent, hundred percent. David, there's a lot of frustration <laughs> to go around. So <laughs> let's just call it a truce. <laughs> You're passionate. I'm passionate. Yeah, we're all here together, right? Love it. Appreciate you. Love it. <laughs> it's great. Like I said, it's. Doing this kind of show and also having right. that job. Right. There's there's a balancing act. Oh, yeah. You know, like there's like things that I know, but I can't say because then you're talking out of school because of, you know, sure. how you know those things. Sure. So that's honestly because I know you and because we talk, that's certain things I can't say. Which right. somebody asked last night on the mailbag show, like, what's the best and worst parts of, of you know, covering Notre Dame? Hundred percent. That's the worst part. It's like certain things you just can't say, and you can't correct people when they're just so wrong about something because you can't say anything. Like that's so frustrating. Right. DK is just throwing money at us. Seriously. Thanks for the super one super chats. Plural. DK. Like that's those two are two different ones, by the way. Like that, I, I know that's why it's I said this one, super chat. Yeah, it's this one twice. I don't DK, know if you're drinking man. cocktails back there or what, DK, Woo! but we do appreciate it. Man, thank you so much. Big fan of DK. Beefeater N D O eight. Hartman in Ooh. five years. NFL, CFL, USFL, arena football, or sitting next to Collinsworth in the Notre Dame booth. Gosh. I mean, if he wants to, it'll be USFL. If he doesn't want to, it'll be doing Remember it's UFL else. now because or, the USFL is yeah, right. gone. You're right. UFL. Because it's like XFL and USL put together. The point. So it's either going to be the UFL or it's going to be something else that's not football related. That would be my guess. <laughs> DK DK's just happy that he got to see my beast. That's, that's <laughs> what he says it's all about. <laughs> hey, man, we can have you yell at people more often. <laughs> Jeez. James is talking about coaching. Again, like – haven't they been to the Sweet 16 the last two years? And in college sports, isn't part of coaching recruiting? She's an elite recruiter. The same offensive system that they're running right now is the offensive system that got them to the Elite Eight the last two years, or not the Elite Eight, the Sweet 16 the last two years, and nearly got them to the Elite Eight two years ago after going on the road in the first two rounds yeah. of the tournament. I mean, you can always point to coaching to some extent. Sure. But again, I just, I, I think when you look at the way this roster is composed right now, it's not because of any mistakes that were made in recruiting or any inherent right. flaws in the coaching. To me, it is much more mm -hmm. about the injuries that this team has had to yeah. absorb. And they're just, they're not there what completely. You can do. It changes There's, what you can do X's and O's wise. It just does. Right. You know, right. yeah. that's exactly right. And from a depth standpoint, right as well. Uh, the, uh like the question about Hartman, <laughs> five years. That's it's it's really tough because I feel like we've seen the best of Hartman, we've seen the worst of Hartman, and the question is going to be: Is his worst something that can keep him in the NFL? Because See, you he know, could like, be look a backup. At, like he's a smart well, kid. Like he could do that, I suppose. Right, but like, look at what happened to Ian Book when he got his chance a couple years ago, and he was still with the Saints. It was a total disaster. Right, and if Hartman gets out there on the field and has a game that looks like that, then I don't think that his his upside can get him any farther than what Ian Book's upside got him. Yeah, you know? and now Ian is just fighting to stay on practice squads at this point which is true i i do think well i shouldn't say this because i don't know i i i don't i don't want to put it out there i just i think i think hartman could be a better backup than ian book i'll just leave it at that from a, some of the off the field type stuff i feel like hartman will be a better backup i'll just leave it at that i don't disagree with that i don't disagree Salty, Ooh. they're just they're just throwing they're just throwing fifties at us. Man, now. I just think you 
we, <laughs> you need to blow up. You can yell at me I next so. time. That's fine. I didn't realize that anger was what you guys were looking for in this show. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, this is great. Salty wants to know if I can step out from behind the mic and, and tune the team up during a timeout. So. <laughs> I mean, where, where they I have didn't you know set what up? I set myself up for. Like, where they like have Vince you set the, up for some of these away games, you can just step right in the huddle pretty easily. Vince and Jesse have, you know, have seen me at my saltiest. So <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's awesome. And I mean, what you just saw. That's like, I don't know, 75%. Oh, oh, yeah. We're not even, I mean, we're not even, we're not in the danger zone at all. So. Chief Brody's throwing his, his uh, <laughs> buck 99. I'm not rich like salty. Leave him alone. All right. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Thanks, man. Nonetheless. um, We'll just get to. Trying to see where we are here. We'll get to uh, one more because I can actually hear the boy in the other room. Uh, I thought so, I heard his voice actually a little bit ago. Did I was you? Like, oh, somebody yeah. showed up. And they're yeah. they're waiting for me to uh, to do oh, tonight's good. Christmas night. That's right. Way. So I have to play with my internet. So you know we got stuff to do. Yeah. And high school basketball. Can't forget that on a Friday night. Oh, that's right. <clears throat> let's uh, let's get a couple questions in. All right. Here. Salty says regarding the IB hookup in Indy during the first week of March, hosted by Squirrel Roberts and Sean Davis during the NFL Combine, will you be in attendance? This is the first I'm hearing. Of yes. This. Well, they're so. in there. They're there for there for the Combine, obviously. And Ryan had asked me a few months ago if I was going to come down. You're not. You're going to be busy. You're going to be. Yeah, I'm going to be in, in the Carolina. ACC tournament the first week. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So that's where you're going to be uh, in March. You know, I got to work, so I don't think I'm going to be. Plus, Notre Dame football obviously opens up spring practice on the 7th. And so that's what I'll be gearing up for. So I will be that's right, right here. Yep. Salty also wants to know, which is the next Notre Dame coach? Which is the next coach Notre Dame should lock up with a contract extension? You may include Max Bulla. Well, it wouldn't be an extension. It would be a contract, period. Yeah, he's got to get his first contract first. Yes. So. So I think obviously he's going to be the one to get his first contract. Um, I believe Mike Mickens got an extension already because he would be the next person. I think on you're right. My list. They haven't announced it. I don't believe, and we haven't had any. Yeah. Right. We haven't really reports talked about or anything. It. But I thought it had happened. I have to double check with Brian. To me, it's Mickens one. or Washington. Yes. Right? Agreed. Agreed. And they like Mickens, in that I order. Think, yeah, and yeah, and I think Mickens is ahead of Washington in terms of because like this is a guy who is already being talked about during the season yeah. about potentially becoming yeah. a defensive coordinator. Obviously, the thing again, I'm not taking anything away from Al Washington because I do think he did a great job coaching that defensive line last year and and things are trending in the right direction for him. I think the circumstances were just unique because his alma mater was looking for a head coach. And the last time around when Halfley got the job, Washington was also in the mix at, at, at that point before he had ever even come to Notre Dame. So this is two rounds he has been in the mix there to be head coach at Boston College, in part because it is his offensive coordinator and apparently or, or it is his alma mater. And apparently there are a lot of alums, you know, who really think a lot about Washington. And so I don't I don't think you necessarily have to rush to lock him up. I think maybe. You know, like he has another year like he just had, then I think then a then a year from now, maybe we're talking about some kind yeah. of extension for him. Yeah, no, good call. Good call. All right. Well, I think that's gonna do it for tonight. Okay. Vince. All right. Hey, you save a couple of those that. for uh for later. That's right. I like it. We've always got more. Uh, always leave always. them wanting more. Those those couple that, that we did not get to, you can get to those anytime. Stymie says, if tonight is Christmas, <laughs> this show is the festivus airing of grievances. I thought that was perfect. Had to star that one. That's right. Because <laughs> we never we never got to do our festivus show no! this year because of when it fell Gosh. on the, you know, I think it fell on the weekend and we were yeah. already gone, you know, on vacation and all that. It was all messed up next right. year. Because that is a tradition, man. There's a tradition to do the airing of grievances, man. Didn't you do one with all like former Notre Dame coaches one time? You put it on the air. And didn't what you, do you mean? An air like wasn't. Didn't Notre you Dame do coaches. like a 
an airing of grievances and you like acted oh, out like, the like a like a spoof kind of thing yes. like they were sitting around i did yeah did like i was impersonating some too? voice yeah i got like a call from somebody and it was like come on man <laughs> Oh, I re I don't remember any of the specifics, but I remember it was hilarious. And then somebody got their panties in a bunch about yeah. it over Notre Dame. Was there like... was like a Faust impersonation, <laughs> and I think Willingham had just Willingham been fired was or definitely something. in there. Yes. Yeah, yep. yep. Oh, that was yeah, that was great. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was great. It was fantastic. Oh, good times back yes. in the days, back in the yes. days. And that was that was pre BK, in case anybody is curious. Like that was way pre BK. That might have that was that was like right around the time Weiss was hired. So I think it probably was. That's yeah. right. Yeah, because it was because it would have been in December. I think. Yeah. Yes. When Weiss was hired. Yes. Yep. I mean, it was it was perfect. It was so great. Well, guys, <sighs> thanks again for those super chats. We do yeah. appreciate it. We're bragging let's, with the boss, uh, man. We're bringing in the money now. Let's recharge the batteries this weekend and uh, come back strong <laughs> on Monday. I'll actually be at Duke <clears throat> Monday calling oh, a game, so yeah. hopefully things go well so we don't have to come back and get all you know our panties in a bunch here <laughs> on the show. So everybody have a great weekend. Vince, I'm glad your internet is working. Hit the like Me button too. on your way out. And, of course, subscribe, rate, and review. Andre says, join the boards. Do it. Do All it. right. Have a good weekend. Talk to you later. I've been Asian Sports Talk.